Welcome to the Foundations One video. You've got your study guide, you've got your review books, you've got your caffeine-laden beverage of choice, and a dozen pens and highlighters and a dazzling assortment of colors. So let's start with some basic embryology. Let's begin at the beginning, all the way back at conception. A sperm meets an oocyte and that forms a zygote. The zygote begins to divide and as more and more cells accumulate, it becomes a morula. A morula comes from the Latin word for mulberry, and a morula kind of resembles a mulberry. I like to know where some of these medical terms come from because I find that makes them a lot easier to remember. So you've gone from a zygote to a morula, and then as the morula keeps dividing and growing, it becomes a blastocyst. And the important thing about a blastocyst is that it has an inner cell mass and an outer trophoblast. And these two parts of the blastocyst mark the first step towards specialization taking genetically identical cells and turning them into distinct specialized tissues that perform specialized functions. The inner cell mass will eventually become the fetus and the trophoblast will become the placenta. Let's talk about how the placenta develops. Obviously the placenta can't begin to develop until the embryo has implanted into the endometrium, which takes place on day six. Now for that first week after conception, the zygote lives on nutrients that were stored in the oocyte. But eventually, the growing embryo needs more nutrients in order to grow and develop. And in order to obtain those nutrients from the endometrium, it needs a placenta. Implantation occurs when the blastocyst burrows into the endometrium. The trophoblast portion of the blastocyst further specializes into the inner cytotrophoblast and the outer syncytiotrophoblast. The syncytiotrophoblast is responsible for secreting the hormone HCG, which tells the mother's corpus luteum that a successful implantation has taken place so that the corpus luteum will continue to secrete progesterone and that progesterone maintains the endometrial lining and prevents menstruation. Later on, after implantation, the trophoblast eventually forms what we call the chorion, which grows little finger-like projections called villi, and these chorionic villi grow into the endometrium and become the fetal component of the placenta. The maternal component of the placenta is basically the endometrium that these chorionic villi are invading, and we call this maternal component the decidua basalis. And then while we're talking about support structures, there's also a thin layer of tissue called the amnion, which contains the amniotic fluid. And there's something called the yolk sac, which serves as a secondary source of nutrients, kind of like the adult liver, as well as a source of non-specialized stem cells. Now, at the same time that the trophoblast is undergoing specialization to become the placenta, that inner cell mass is also specializing and becoming a three-layer disc called a gastrula. The first step toward becoming a gastrula is that during week two, the inner cell mass becomes a two-layer structure, or a bilaminar disc. Those two layers are called the hypoblast and the epiblast. And that two-layer bilaminar disc doesn't last very long because during week three, the epiblast will differentiate into a trilaminar disc with three distinct germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And this trilaminar disc is called a gastrula. Looking at this chart in your study guide, you can see how these three germ layers are basically going to become the entire fetus. We're going to go through these different cell types in just a second and talk about which tissues are derived from each of these three germ layers. But just to recap how far along we've come, we started with a single-celled zygote, which divided a few times and became a morula. Then the morula became a blastocyst, composed of that inner cell mass and the outer trophoblast. The trophoblast invaded the endometrium and will eventually become the placenta and that inner cell mass becomes a bilaminar disc and then a trilaminar disc with ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. During weeks three through eight, which we call the embryonic period, these three germ layers begin to form organs. Now it's very important for your test to know which of these germ layers give rise to these specific organs and tissues and individual cell types. It's definitely high yield to know which tissues come from the neural crest, which arises from the ectoderm. But first we need to know what the neural crest is. Neural crest is involved with the very first steps of nervous system development, which is called neurulation, or the formation of a neural tube. So here's how it works. By the end of the third week of development, there are the three germ layers, the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. Right down the middle of the embryo, some of the mesoderm forms a little longitudinal cord of dense tissue called the notochord. The notochord's job is to induce the ectoderm cells right above it to form something called the neural plate. Then once the neural plate has formed, the edges of it start to fold up and form this neural tube, which will go on to become the brain and the spinal cord. But during that folding process, some of these ectodermal neural plate cells kind of pinch off from the leading edges of the neural plate, and they merge to form a crest of tissue that overlies the neural tube. And this crest of tissue is called the neural crest. 
So the neural tube and the neural crest are derived from the ectoderm, but it's the notochord and the mesoderm that makes it happen. Now, eventually, these ectoderm-derived neural cells are going to start to leave the neural crest and migrate to other parts of the embryo as it develops, like little missionaries or ambassadors that perform various jobs throughout the body. So let's talk about what tissues and cell types are derived from the neural crest. The mnemonic I came up with is magic cops, like these little neural crest cells are police officers that are dispersed in the body to do their various jobs. The M is for the melanocytes. The A is for the aorticopulmonary septum, or the spiral septum, which separates the aorta from the pulmonary trunk in the developing heart. When we get to cardiology and the embryology of the heart, we're going to talk about how if the aorticopulmonary septum fails to develop normally, you can get a truncus arteriosus, or transposition of the great vessels. The G is for ganglia, which includes autonomic ganglia, the dorsal root ganglia, which are the ganglia for the sensory afferent nerves of the body, and this also includes the enteric ganglia, the ganglia of the enteric nervous system. So the neural crest cells are basically responsible for the entire peripheral nervous system. And that also includes the Schwann cells. The eye is for the stroma of the iris in the eye. We're going to see that different parts of the eye are derived from all three germ layers. C is for the chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla. These are the cells that make catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine. You can think of the adrenal medulla as like a big, overgrown sympathetic ganglion. We already noted that the sympathetic ganglia come from neural crest cells. The C in COPS is for the cranial nerves. Again, peripheral nervous system and ganglia, which includes the cranial nerves. The O is for the ossicles of the middle ear and also the odontoblasts. Now, odontoblasts are cells that play a role in the development of teeth, specifically the dentin of the teeth. So you might think about crest toothpaste to remember that part of the teeth are derived from neural crest cells. The P is for the parafollicular cells of the thyroid, also called the C cells. These are the cells that secrete calcitonin. And then the S is for sclera. Now it's fairly high yield to know all these different neural crest derivatives. I'd say this is a three or maybe a four star topic. Throughout the course, in addition to saying that this topic's important or that detail is high yield, we'll occasionally give certain topics a star rating. It's just a shorthand way of telling you what you're more likely to be tested on. If we say something's a three-star topic, that means that there's about a 50% chance that you're going to see that on your exam. It's a topic we know they test on, but only about 50% of students get a test item on it. I mean, the exams aren't exactly perfectly identical, right? They have this enormous pool of exam items to choose from. But they don't pull the right items at random. Certain items, certain topics come up more frequently and are tested more heavily. So a three-star rating means about 50% of students will see that topic on their actual exam. A four-star topic means that you should expect to see at least one question on that topic. There's no guarantee, but pretty much every student reports being asked about these four-star topics. And then a five-star topic means that you should expect multiple test items on that particular topic. So again, the neural crest der derivatives are a three- or four-star topic. There's a better than 50% chance that you're going to be asked to identify one of these cell types as a neural crest derivative. So I'm going to come back and review these in a slightly different way after we go through the rest of the germ layers. We talked about how the notochord induces the nearby ectoderm to become the neural tube and how the neural crest splits off from the neural tube. So we have the neuroectoderm, which is basically the neural tube plus the neural crest, and that's distinct from the surface ectoderm. So let's finish the neuroectoderm first. We already talked about the neural crest, now let's look at the neural tube. The neural tube basically gives rise to the central nervous system. You have the neurons of the brain and the spinal cord, the oligodendrocytes that myelinate those CNS neurons, the astrocytes that support those CNS neurons, and the ependymal cells that secrete CSF. The neural tube also gives rise to the pineal gland and the posterior pituitary, or the neurohypophysis. And the neural tube also gives rise to the retina. And then the surface ectoderm is ectodermal tissue that did not become neurological because it did not get influenced by the notochord. But still, I like to think of this as forming a bunch of other structures in the head, like the lenses of the eye, the olfactory epithelium, and the inner ear. So lots of stuff related to the special senses. Uh, and then some other head structures that come from surface ectoderm are the anterior pituitary, the oral epithelium, the parotid glands, and the enamel of the teeth. Remember, the rest of the teeth comes from the neural crest. And then since this is the surface ectoderm, it's fairly easy to remember that the epidermis and the sweat glands come from the surface ectoderm, and also the mammary glands, and then one more, which is kind of an outlier, is that the portion of the anal canal that's distal to the pectinate line comes from the surface ectoderm. 
So both extreme ends of the GI tract come from the surface ectoderm, the oral epithelium and the very distal part of the anal canal. Moving on then to the endodermal structures. Now these are pretty easy too because the endoderm is essentially your gut tube and things that are derived from the gut. So this includes the GI tract from the esophagus all the way down to the pectinate line in the anus. Now, where does the anal canal distal to the pectinate line come from? We just talked about that, from the surface ectoderm. Other endoderm-derived tissues include the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, also the lungs, the thymus, and the follicular cells of the thyroid. And make note, the lower portion of the vagina comes from the endoderm, and so does the epithelium of the bladder and the urethra. Now, most of the bladder and the urethra are derived from mesoderm along with the rest of the urinary system, but the bladder epithelium and the urethral epithelium are derived from the endoderm. And then the mesoderm is basically everything in between the ectoderm and the endoderm. The mesoderm provides a lot of connective tissue and support tissues like muscle, bone, bone marrow and blood cells, the heart and the blood vessels and the lymphatics, the upper portion of the vagina, so the vagina is derived from both mesoderm and endoderm. The lower portion of the vagina is from the endoderm, the upper portion is from the mesoderm. Also the kidneys and the adrenal cortex, the gonads, and the dermis of the skin. So the bladder epithelium is endodermal, but the kidneys are mesodermal. The epidermis is ectodermal, but the dermis is mesodermal. Now, I know that's a lot of information, and I know it can be pretty overwhelming, but the highest yield part of this is knowing the structures that come from the neural crest. So take a look at number two in your study guide, and we'll review these structures in a slightly different way. Number two says, what neural crest derivatives are found in each of the following adult structures? So right now, I want you to pause the video and try to fill in as many of these as you can in about one minute, then restart the video, and we'll go over them together. In the peripheral nervous system, we get the cranial nerves, autonomic ganglia and nerves, the dorsal root ganglia and the sensory nerves, and the enteric nervous system, and also the Schwann cells. In the ear, you have the ossicles of the middle ear, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. In the eye, you have the stroma of the iris and also the sclera. In the mouth, you find the dentin of the teeth, which comes from the odontoblast. In the thyroid, the neural crest cells give rise to the parafollicular cells. In the heart, you have the aorticopulmonary septum. In the digestive system, you have the enteric nervous system. In the adrenal gland, you have the chromaffin cells of the medulla that come from the neural crest. And then in the skin, the neural crest gives rise to the melanocytes. So make sure you know these. That's almost all the embryology I want to cover for now. For the most part, we're going to talk about the embryology of each organ system one by one as we go through the different systems. So we're going to talk more about the neurological development and the pharyngeal apparatus in the neuro section. We'll talk about the embryology of the heart and the cardiovascular section and so on. But I do want to highlight a few important dates related to organogenesis just to give you some of the big picture markers. We call weeks three through eight the embryonic period. And this is the time when organogenesis takes place. This is the crucial time period in which the embryo is most susceptible to teratogens during organogenesis. Week four is when the four chamber heart begins to develop and also when the four limb buds begin to form. So that's pretty easy to remember. Week four, four chamber heart, four limb buds. Week eight is when we start to see fetal movement. And you can use the fact that there are eight letters in the word movement to associate fetal movement with week eight. And one student suggested that you remember that eight rhymes with gate, and that'll help you think about fetal movement. It's not like the fetus is walking around inside the uterus or anything, but that might be a helpful mnemonic. And week 10 is when the genitalia begin to take on visible sex-specific characteristics. You can think about puberty starting around age 10, or you can think of the word tenitalia, whatever works for you. And remember that these weeks are being measured from the day of conception. In embryology, we're talking about developmental age, which is measured from conception. Now, that seems fairly obvious, except that OBGYNs in the U.S. keep track of gestational age. They count weeks of gestation from the last menstrual period, not from the day of conception. So a 40-week gestational pregnancy in the U.S. is actually a 38-week-old fetus by developmental age. Now we're ready for the end of session quiz. At the end of each video, we're going to have a short quiz, usually three or four questions, to review some of the highest yield material covered in that video. The quiz is found in your study guide, so what I want you to do is pause the video for just a minute or two, try to answer questions three, four, and five in your study guide. Don't spend too long on them. Then once you've answered those questions, you can restart the video, and I'll go over the answers with you. All right, let's go over the answer to the Foundations 1 end of session quiz together. 
First question, what's the relationship between the notochord, the neural crest, the neural plate, and the neural tube? Well, the notochord is part of the mesoderm, and the notochord induces the nearby ectoderm to form the neural plate. Then the neural plate gives rise to the neural tube and the neural crest cells. Next, what is the embryologic origin of each of the following adult structures? So the anterior pituitary arises from the surface ectoderm. The posterior pituitary comes from the neural tube. The sclera comes from the neural crest. The lens comes from the surface ectoderm. The retina comes from the neural tube. And the mammary glands, parotid glands, and sweat glands all come from the surface ectoderm. Now, I told you these were important, and we're going to quiz you on these several more times throughout the videos. And the last question, at what developmental age does each of the following events typically take place? So four-chambered heart begins to develop. That's at four weeks. Remember, four-chambered heart, week four. Genitalia begin to take on visible sex-specific characteristics. That's at 10 weeks. Fetal movement begins. Remember, movement has eight letters, so that's eight weeks. And then limb buds begin to form. That's four weeks. Four limbs, week four. All right, that's it for the quiz. The next video is Foundations 2, and we're going to talk about teratogenesis. I'll see you then.